those kinds of tangible battles, sometimes we can forget that we are in fact in a battle. Yeah. On Spanish Wells, one of the most blessed places in the world. I went off to a men's prayer meeting a couple of years ago on a Saturday morning. Now, you know, I don't think I'm even going to tell the story. I see battles. I see real, tangible battles and spiritual warfare. And I recognize them for what they are because my friends that have told me stories just like what I told you in, in China. We are in a battle. One of the devil's greatest strategies in the West is just to kind of keep it quiet so that we forget and we don't live like we're in a battle. And so the Apostle Paul, he reminds us, that's praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. He reminds us here that, um, that the context is that we're in a battle and we need to fight on our knees. In fact, that's point number two. Point number one, you're in a battle. Point number two, we fight on our knees. So let's skip forward. It's so worth it. The, the armor is a beautiful topic. It's just beyond what we have the time to cover today. I noticed, by the way, there's a flyer for a weekend that's going to cover the armor. That's, that's wonderful. It's a great topic. So let's read it. Verse 18. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. So simply put, we, we fight on our knees. Um, praying. This is the first activity that we're supposed to participate in after we put on our, our armor. Praying always. Sometimes it's easiest to start this way. What does the apostle not mean according to the word of God? Like when you harmonize scripture with scripture, how do you figure out what he means and how do you figure out what he does not mean? Well, one thing he does not mean is you're always saying words to God. That's not what he means, right? In fact, you can tell that from Matthew chapter 6. The Lord Jesus says, they think they will be heard for their many words, right? Talking about the speaking of empty prayers to God. What he's describing is a, a consistent prayer relationship with God. If you, use, if you use the idea of a telephone, you never hang up. My problem is that I hang up. Right now, the Lord's helping me get over this. Praise God. This is my greatest delight. You wake up in the morning. One of my favorite verses, when I awake, you are there. You pop awake in the morning and he's right there and you can say, good morning, Lord. Right. And then you go all day long, unbroken fellowship. If you sin at some point, the spirit of God rebukes you. You flee to the presence of God. You confess your sin. Come right back to, to restoration. It's amazing. Jesus Christ will wash your feet over and over again that you might have fellowship with him according to that picture in John 13. You go through the whole day. At night, you say, Lord, I love you. Thank you for today. Good night. And, and you put your head on the pillow. You never say goodbye. In my life, even when I prayed in years past, I would pray, 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 however long or short. Pray, pray, pray. And then when I was saying amen, I was effectively saying goodbye. And I don't mean that I was going to then participate in ugly sin. I don't mean anything like that at all. Just the communication, the communion of prayer. Boy, the communion of prayer is one of, is the... It's the most beautiful thing I've ever experienced in my life. And it utterly shocked me. We started seeking God because we desperately needed him. We could not solve the problems that we saw in the church in North America. And, and we tried. Please believe me. We tried and we tried and we tried. We tried to preach harder. We tried to study harder. Um, we tried looking for solutions. We tried to have conferences. I mean, we tried and we tried and we tried. And then we realized we can't solve this problem. And so we realized we need to go to the one who can solve the problem. And so we started to pray. And so we were laboring in prayer, laboring in prayer, laboring in prayer. And all of a sudden, this laboring in prayer in the presence of God, it gave birth to communion with the Lord. And that was utterly, radically life-changing. That's what I want for the people of God in a nutshell. I just want them to dwell in the presence of God. I want them to enjoy the Lord Jesus the way he deserves to be enjoyed, the way he wants to enjoy you. So it's not constantly talk, <clears throat> talking. It's, it's not that you never leave your prayer closet. It's a Christ-like life. You work hard, like Mark chapter 1. He works hard all day long. The crowd comes to him in the evening. He ministers to them well into the night. And then a Christ-like life is not only intense effort for God, but also it says the next morning he arose early in the day and he went off by himself to pray. 
So a Christ-like life is, is a life of intense labor for, the, for God and also a life of communion with God. That's a Christ-like life. That's all that we would want to follow and emulate is, is that kind of life. Hudson Taylor said years ago, he said, we go forward on our knees. A, a young, young missionary wrote, wrote a senior missionary at that point. They were really struggling in a, in a hard mission field. Um, and they wrote to Hudson Taylor, and they, and they said, we're just on the very edge of quitting. We're seeing no fruit. We're questioning whether or not God has us to be here. Um, we just do not know what to do. And so we're crying out to you, a senior missionary, for your advice. And he wrote back two words. Maybe some of you know this story. He wrote back two words. He said, he said in quotes, try tears. And, uh, and they read that, and they, and they went to the Lord, and they did what this passage says, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. And they just began to plead with the Lord, and strongholds began to come down. Right? That's Second Corinthians, the tearing down of strongholds. Footholds began to be removed, right? That's Ephesians 4. Give no opportunity. The Greek word tapas. It, it's, the idea is that you open the door and the enemy can reach in through the door and grab a hold of your foot, right? He has a way to influence your life. That's miserable. There's somebody in my life very much that used to call me on Friday before conferences. And it happened over and over and over again. They would call me and they would just light into me. And I would get off the phone feeling so beat up, right? Like, how could I possibly go and speak at this conference this weekend? And then I realized that it's a foothold. The enemy can reach in through the door and influence them. These things are torn down through prayer. And so the way forward, we go forward on on our knees. So praying always with all prayer and supplication. So let me make a comment about that little phrase, prayer and supplication. In my experience, 95% of what the people of God think of when you say prayer is supplication. Like when we say we're going to have a prayer meeting, typically what we think of is we're going to get together and we're going to ask God for things, right? That's supplication. And that's biblical, by the way. It's wonderful, and it's biblical, and it's, a, it's a, an inherited right of every child of God. But notice, I love that the Apostle Paul, by the, by the inspiration of the Spirit of God, distinguishes these things. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. So the word prayer is general. The word supplication is specific. So we'll talk about prayer first. Prayer incorporates biblically every kind of prayer that God has given to mankind. So supplication, that would be one kind of prayer. Intercession. Boy, do we live in a day where we need intercessors. You know who intercessors reminds God of? Jesus Christ. Remember when Moses went and interceded for the people of God? Boy, that reminds the Father of Jesus Christ. Do you remember when Nehemiah sat? Nehemiah chapter 1. I was fast in and pray in. He sat and interceded, right? The city of God, the glory of God, it lie in ruins. How did Nehemiah, the great leader of that generation, how did he respond to the fact that, that, that the glory of God was not what it should be amongst the people of God? He sought the Lord in prayer. You could keep going, and I'm not going to, but intercessor after intercessor after intercessor, they knew God, they walked with God, they knew God's word, what they had of it at that time. And from that, they discerned God's mind. Also, Amos 3, 7, I mean, it says the Lord does nothing apart from sharing his mind with his servants, the prophets. There's a, there's a sharing of thoughts when you walk intimately with God, and then they would respond to that through intercession. Boy, we live in a day where men and women of God must stand before God and say, we have sinned. Here we are this day, though none can stand before you because of this, right? Our sins have risen up over our heads. That's intercession, right? Pleading with God on behalf of the people. David is a beautiful one. Thanksgiving. How many of Paul's epistles begin with some element of thanksgiving? It's not because Paul was following the, the pattern for the proper way to write a New Testament epistle. He just had a good relationship with God. And then out of that flowed a heart of thanksgiving. But that's a beautiful kind of prayer. By the way, it's a powerful kind of prayer too. Thanksgiving. Adoration. I have a friend back home that goes on walks with the Lord physical walks and he lives in Canada and so and so like there's a season of life where Canada is a frozen tundra 
And so he doesn't go in those seasons. But when he can, he'll physically walk with the Lord. And he purposed one day, he went on a two-hour walk, and he purposed one day not to ask the Lord for one thing. I thought that was really neat. He said, I'm only going to adore you today. And he said it was a real discipline because we're so used to asking, right? But he said he had the most beautiful time with the Lord. That's a beautiful kind of prayer. Adoration is a, is a biblical kind of prayer. Confession. Worship. I didn't know not long ago that, that you could go on worship walks with the Lord. Man, that's a wonderful thing. In fact, in fact I, I wasn't even aware, aware not so long ago. And I don't mean intellectually aware. I mean experientially aware, all right? This was not a part of my life. Personal, private worship of God, right? A relationship with him that is so overflowing that you just can't contain yourself in his presence. And then when you do get together with God's people, it just overflows. Boy, our corporate worship of, of God needs to flow out of personal worship. Amen? These things will radically transform the breaking of bread service. These things would radically transform our prayer meetings that are, that are being described here. Um, prayers of consecration like Romans 12. Imprecatory prayers, prayers of judgment. And then finally, travail. That's described in the book of James, right? Elijah was a man with like passions unto us, but he prayed. Right? He prayed effectually. In fact, it says he prayed in his praying. He earnestly prayed. That's travail. The Lord is teaching us little by little by little about these things. Winning God's victories in prayer. Travail. Uh, let me just throw this out there. Travail is the hardest work that I've ever done in my entire 43 years. The hardest work that I've ever experienced is travail in the presence of God. Um, the burdens that come on you when you make yourself available to God. The burdens that he shares with you are his burdens. And by definition, they're God-sized burdens. And there's times where you feel like you're going to be crushed, crushed by the burden. And you labor in prayer as long as he wants you to. You labor in prayer until you break through. Like the Puritan writers, they used to say, pray until you pray. Pray that you pray. You break through to God, right? You, you labor, you fight a battle. That's what's being described in this passage. You fight a battle in prayer, and then you, you pray. I'm just going to leave it at that for now. Travail. He says, you're in a battle, put on your armor, and then in, he says, once you have all your armor on, this is how you fight. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. So supplication, um, that's the specific word. It just means to ask the Lord for something. Um, it could be almost anything. I've had these glasses for almost three years. A number of months ago, I was taking a walk with the Lord, and, and I, thought, I thought, Lord... Um, I think before we go to California, we're planning to go to California in June. I said, Lord, I think before we go to California, it would probably be a really good idea for me to get another pair of glasses. Um, and then not long after that at all, I got a text message and someone said, do you need a pair of glasses? And, um, and, I, and I just texted back and I said, well, I think I'll probably need a pair of glasses in a coming day. And he said, well, the Lord put it on my heart to, get, to buy you a pair of glasses, right? That's supplication, and that's a beautiful thing. The Lord is honored when we bring to him our requests. I have two kids. I love it when they come to me, right, with their requests. And the Lord loves this. Supplication. How about grace to help in time of need? That's, that's supplication, right? Lord, I really have a hard time loving this person, but I want to love them. I don't want to sin against you. I don't want to sin against them. I want the love of Christ to flow through me. In fact, I want to love well. I want to love the way Christ loved. Lord, I don't have this ability in myself. Would you please fill me up that I might, that I might be a conduit of your love to other people? That's supplication, right? Lord, I long for people to be saved. That could be intercession or supplication, but you, you get the idea. Now, let's get to this little phrase. This is what we've been driving at. You're in a battle. Put on your armor. Once you put on your armor, you fight through this, through, through prayer. The people of God, how do we go forward? We go forward on our knees. And then he uses this phrase, which I deeply love. Supplication in the spirit. So what does that mean? Uh, according to the word of God, what does that mean? So if you look at God's New Testament, you find phrases like this. Um, we looked at this last night. Walk in him, right? So as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk. And you find that phrase all over the New Testament. Walk in him. Being built up in him. 
In, in Galatians 5 and Romans 8, walk in the Spirit, be led by the Spirit. So you look at all of these phrases in their context and you come to this, this very clear understanding that to walk in the Spirit, to be led by the Spirit, very simply means to allow Him to have His way. Right, So when you're walking in the Spirit, you present yourself at the beginning of the day, and then you walk through your day, allowing Him to have His way. And so if He wants to interrupt your, your planned schedule, that's fine. It's His prerogative to do so. That's walking in the Spirit, as empowered by the Spirit, as directed by the Spirit. A beautiful concept. We'll probably talk more about that specific this afternoon. So you allow Him to have to have his way. Praying in the spirit is exactly the same thing. What's the problem with most of our prayer meetings? I'm being horribly overly general. What is one major problem with most of our prayer meetings? We stop praying when we're done with our prayer requests. Like back home, um, Topeka Gospel Chapel, we didn't want anything to compete with prayer. And so midweek prayer meeting, we pray, and that's all we do. And I'm not suggesting that's a right way to do it. I'm not suggesting that anybody needs to follow that pattern. But that's what we do. And so we get together, and, and we have um, a board just similar, very similar to this. And so we will, we will take prayer requests for hopefully 10 minutes. Sometimes it bleeds over just a little bit. And then we pray, right? And typically, we pray for those things and then typically, once you get to the end of that, you, you're done. We do that for about, about an hour, something like that. 6.30 to 7.30, generally speaking. Sometimes it goes a little longer, sometimes a little shorter. L let me illustrate what I'm saying. There's, there were two of us that were so burdened. This is years ago, five, six years ago, probably. There were two of us that were so burdened that, that we said, what are we going to do? And we'd been laboring in prayer together on the phone. And so we said, we need more. We need to pray more. We need to seek our God. And so he lives four hours from me. And so we, we each drove two hours. We met in the middle. We got a hotel room. Um, we met at noon and we had lunch. And so we looked at each other across the lunch table. Now our plan was to check into that hotel room at like two o'clock and then to pray until check out the next day at 11. And we were just going to seek our God. And so I looked across the table and I said, have you ever had an all-night prayer meeting before? And he shook his head. This is a very godly man, by the way. Older, wiser, knows his Bible backwards and forwards. Have you ever had a, an all-night prayer meeting? No. I said, do you know how to have an all-night prayer meeting? He said, no. <laughs> and then he looked at me. He said, have you ever done this? I said, no. Right? I said, okay, well, let's write down what we're burdened about. So I pulled out my phone and an electronic notepad, and, and literally in probably two minutes, we wrote down six things, right? No, we'd been laboring in prayer. Our heart was the same. So we wrote down six things, and, and we said, okay, these are the things we're going we're gonna to pray about. So we finished our lunch. We paid for our lunch. We went and checked into the hotel room. Within five minutes, we, were, we set down our stuff, and we were knelt at the end of, of our respective beds, and we started to pray. And in 15 or 20 minutes, we had prayed for everything on our list. And many times it occurred to me, yikes, right? We're intending to pray all night. Neither one of us have ever done this before. We have no idea what we're doing. How do you have an all-night prayer meeting? This could be a really long night, right? That occurred to me many times. And, the, and then the coolest thing happened. Finally, when we got to the end of ourselves, right? The beginning part, it was just us. When we got to the end of ourselves, then we began to pray in the Spirit. What do I mean by that? Do I mean something mystical? No. We began to pray as directed by the Spirit of God. He took over. And so we're praying, He's leading. That's the whole concept of praying in the Spirit. You can pray in a way that is totally ineffectual. You can pray every day in a way that's totally ineffectual. In fact, this is a massive topic. The Lord has told us in His Word reasons He does not answer people's prayers. Reasons why your prayers are cut or thwarted. Right? Why they bounce off the ceiling. He's told us in his word all of that information. It's all right there. You can pray in a completely ineffectual way or you can pray as empowered by the Spirit of God. You can pray as directed by the Spirit of God. So that first session, we prayed for two, two and a half hours. It was wonderful. And then we got up, we, we moved around right for just a, just a few minutes. Um, and then he looked at me and he said, 
or this is brand new to us. He looked at me and said, let's read our Bibles. And I said, okay. And so we sat down on our beds and I opened to my regular consecutive systematic reading and I started reading. And in a few minutes, right, he did the same thing. In a few minutes, the Lord showed me through his word what we should pray about next. Again, not mystical, it's just normal. The Lord's directing, right? The same way a parent directs a child. When you walk across the street, have you ever noticed the grip that a mother has on a little child as you walk across the street? She's guiding that child, and she will not let that child enter into his own will, right? Because, because that could bring incredible danger. And so she's got this motherly grip, right? So the child is walking, but the mother is guiding. It's the same concept. And so the Lord showed me what we should pray about next. And I went like this. I went like this, and I looked over at my friend. And in that same moment, he looked up from his Bible, and he looked at me, and I said, I said what should we pray about next? And he said it. The Lord showed us the same thing that we, should, that we should pray about next. Man, that was exciting. For two guys that had no idea what they were doing. So we get down on our knee. No, that time we laid on the beds. Not that it matters. Who cares? But, but we laid face down on the beds, and we had another two, two and a half hour session of prayer. Then we got up, used the restroom, read our Bibles. The Lord showed, showed us what we should pray about next. Long story short, that just, that just kept going. And so the problem with, with so many prayer meetings, in fact, I would say most prayer meetings, is they come to an end when we, when we come to an, the end of ourselves. And really, that's where we need to begin. We need to offer ourselves to pray. The great lesson of that first all-night prayer meeting, the overwhelming great lesson was if you will offer yourself and consecrate yourself to be a people of prayer, then the living God will meet with you in that place and he will guide you. And if he is not guiding you, then something is wrong. And if you seek him about what is wrong, he will show you what is wrong and what is hindering. He is more committed to us praying in the Spirit than we could ever possibly be committed to praying in the Spirit. Amen? And so he will guide us on. So if I lived in Scotland, this is what I would do. I would, on Friday nights, we're going to pray. This is what we just did on Spanish Wells for a month. And it was beautiful. I wish you all could have been there. Um, I would just say, on Friday nights, we're going to seek God. We're going to meet at 7 o'clock. We're going to pray in the liberty of the Spirit. He's the only person that's going to be in charge of the prayer meetings. Maybe we'll sing. Maybe we won't. Maybe we'll share a little bit of Scripture. Maybe we won't. Maybe we'll adore. Maybe we'll worship. Maybe we'll supplicate. Maybe we'll travail. We'll do whatever the Spirit of God leads us to. But I would systematically um, seek God. We go forward on our knees. And that's the same thing that the Apostle Paul is saying in this passage. He's, he's saying, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. That's how battles are won. Wiest puts it this way. The fullness of the Holy Spirit is the prerequisite to effectual praying. The Spirit, when yielded to, leads us in our petitions and generates within us the faith necessary to acceptable and answered prayer. The fullness of the Spirit is the prerequisite to effectual praying. Point number three in the outline. This will be somewhat brief, but we must, we must look at this before we close. Point number three, we must press on. We must press on. And I'm taking this straight out of the text. This isn't some visitor from America saying rah, rah, rah. Right? We must keep going. I mean, look, look at what he says, verse 18. He says, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. If you unpack that, it means this. Um, uh, being watchful, that's agripneo. It's, it's to continue or to be vigilant. So the Apostle Paul is saying you must continue in prayer. You must be vigilant in prayer. Do you remember, put this in its proper context of a war. So this is a soldier. How does the soldier fight? In prayer. And then he says, you must be a vigilant soldier of Christ Jesus. That's what's in that word, watchful. This is a beautiful thought, and we're not going to take the time to look into it, but watchful in your prayers. The end of all things is at hand, therefore be serious and watchful in your prayers, says Peter. The Lord Jesus, could you not watch and pray with me for one hour? Right? It's a, it's a beautiful thought if you want to trace it through the word of God. But the Apostle Paul, he's saying you need to continue, you need to be vigilant, and then he even advances this concept biblically with that next phrase. He says, to this end, with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. The word perseverance, it means to stick it out and not quit. 
Isn't that good? So if the Apostle Paul was speaking today, and if he, I shouldn't say if, since, nah, man, Lord help me. Yeah, I have to say it. Since he would be utterly dependent on the Lord, and since he would know exactly what God wanted to be said in this auditorium today, this is what he would say. He would say, you're in a battle. You need to wear your armor. The way the battle is fought, the way that victories are won, is by praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. Not the physical activity of prayer. That can either be Spirit-filled or not. It must be prayer in the Spirit. And then he ends the thought with, you must be vigilant, soldiers of Christ Jesus. You must stick it out and not quit. Perseverance in prayer does not mean that we are trying to twist God's arm, but rather that we are deeply concerned and burdened and we cannot rest until, until we get God's answer. We're not trying, like that's, he's not saying keep trying to twist God's arm. He's saying you feel God's burden. You long for God's victories. These things are found by pressing forward in, in this subject of, of prayer. Now, let me make one application here. Um, in my 20s, you know what I would have said at this point in the message? I did this repeatedly. I did this over and over and over in my 20s. I would have said, be faithful to the prayer meeting. I did that over and over. In fact, I traveled all over North America and I said that. Every time I came across the word prayer in scripture, I said, <laughs> sorry if I broke something. I said, be faithful to the prayer meeting. There's no reason to miss the prayer meeting. My wife laughed at me the other day. I used to say this. I'd say, sure, there's a good reason to miss the prayer meeting. If you have a heart attack, right? And I used to say that, and I used to say that, and I used to say that. I would like to publicly apologize that I ever said that. That is not what the Apostle Paul says here. What the standard that I was representing to God's people is a standard that is about this high. By the way, do I think that a Christ-like life would, find, would produce a commitment to, to the prayer meeting? Yes, I absolutely think that. And I could, I could show so many different ways that that's the life that it produces. But I was presenting this standard to the people of God right here. Right? Every time I came across the subject of prayer, that was my standard right there. Why did I say that? Because that was the practical reality of my life. I served God intensely. I served God in a focused way, in a zealous way. I had, I had so little prayer life. And so when I would read across these scriptures, that's all I was capable of applying from the Word of God. I could tell them the Greek, right? But all I was capable of applying was attend the prayer meeting because that was the practical application in my life. That was where I was in my maturity level, in my immaturity level. What is Paul saying? He's saying, win God's victories in prayer. Press on and be a Christ-like people of prayer. When he exhorts younger Timothy, he says, no soldier en enlisted in active duty entangles himself in the affairs of this life that he may please the one that enlisted him as soldier. Don't let anything get in the way. Don't, don't entangle yourself in anything in this life. You be free to serve the master, he tells to young Timothy. Victories are won in prayer. We have to be a people of prayer, not just a people that faithfully attend a Wednesday night prayer meeting. That standard is like this. A Christ-like life of prayer, becoming a people of prayer, becoming a people that know what it means to lay hold of God in prayer. The prayers of a righteous man, right? That's what he's saying. You must become a people that are filled with the Spirit of God. You must become a people that, are, that know what it means to be directed by God in, in your prayers. So this took me six years um, of seeking God in prayer. I mean, earnestly seeking God in prayer. It took me probably six years um, to, to learn what I'm, about, what I'm about to give you. Helplessness led us to pray. Prayer led to communion. Communion led to intimacy with God, which was utterly shocking to me. I didn't know that you could have an intimacy with God in this life. I thought you just had to wait for the next life. I didn't know you could walk with God the way a friend walks with a friend. By the way, we'll talk about being reverent. In a, in, that, that thought has very much been on my mind. We'll talk about that. 
We want the reverence that Christ had as well as the intimacy. Right? We would seek both of those things. Absolutely. Communion led to intimacy. Intimacy led to abiding in the presence of God. Abiding gave birth to a friendship that I didn't even know was possible. Praying always with all prayer and supplication. Let me throw this out there and then I'll close in prayer. If you, if you want to pursue this, this is how the people of God go forward. If you want to pursue this, some things that have been helpful to me. Um, Ironside has, has a little book. It's not like a mind-blowing book, but it's helpful. It's a little book called Praying in the Spirit. You can find it online and read it if you want to read it for free, or you can order it. I found a copy for just a few dollars online. It's just a tiny little book. Um, Alexander White, I hope many of you have read that. He's got a classic called Lord Teach Us to Pray, and it's White, like W-H-Y-T-E. Um, it's, a, it's a wonderful, helpful book, Alexander White. And then um, Dwight Moody, I would just type, I would just Google Moody and prayer. And, um, and he's, he has so many, like a couple, and they're small, they're easy to read, um, but, but wonderfully helpful. Leonard Ravenhill, he wrote a book on prayer, right? But also just his biography is an incredibly encouraging, helpful um, text on, on the subject of prayer. J. Sidlow Baxter, do you know that name? He has a one volume through the Bible that, that really everybody ought to have in their library. It's, it's wonderful. His biography um, is wonderfully helpful. It's, it's called either A Heart of Flame or A Heart Awake, something like that. But his biography is wonderfully helpful. J. Sidlow Baxter. That's the first person that I ever heard make, introduce in writing the concept that prayer is two-way communication, not one-way communication. Um, yeah, wonderfully, wonderfully helpful. And then finally, E.M. Bounds. Do you know that name? Anybody? Yeah, a few of you. Good. Um, he has a complete, complete works of all of his books, but most of his books are just little. And the complete works is just a compilation. He, he's a classic and a, a must read on this subject of, of prayer. I have a friend right now who's reading his book that's titled The Power, Power in Prayer. So, so helpful works for pressing on. Um, God's message for this session. You are in a battle. We fight on our knees. We must press forward. Um, on behalf of Jesus Christ, whom I'm um, fearfully representing, um, what has to change in your life in order for you to be in conformity to that passage? To be vigilant as a soldier in prayer, to press on in prayer, what has to change? Um, if it's a little tweak, praise God. If it's a radical repentance, praise God. But man, if the Lord speaks and we do nothing, that's called grieving and quenching the Spirit of God. And what we end up with is deadness. So let's pray. Father, we just want to lay this at your feet. Um, thank you for your word. Thank you for the spirit of power that, that is inside of every believer here. The, the spirit of power that attends meetings like this. And, and as the vicar of Christ, literally on the earth, the, represent, the representation of Jesus Christ who is seated at the right hand of your throne. He'll, he'll take little truths and he'll apply them to every heart, every person that's willing to listen. And then even if we're not totally willing to listen, he'll open ears and he'll, he'll draw hearts. Lord, we put all of our trust in you. For every person that's here, we put all of our trust in you. For the glory of Jesus Christ that he is due from every life that's represented in this room, we put all of our trust in you. Lord, please have your perfect work. Please have your powerful work. Please lead us on. Lord, we must become a people of prayer in a way that we're not. Lord, I know eventually this will overflow. Well, fairly quickly, it will overflow into our corporate meetings. And I long for that. But we need to start in our prayer closets. We need to start in our walk with you. The Apostle Paul, he, he tells the Ephesian Christians, Lord, that they, they must pray in the Spirit. And that's our only prayer. How could we possibly do better than that. And so we just pray that the reality of this passage, the reality of these things would, be, would dawn on our hearts, would dawn on our minds, that we would see the way you see and that you would so lead us on in this journey that we would go into a time where we see the power of God unleashed once again amongst the people of God. We long to see your victories in a coming day. You have wonderful ideas and you are working. If we won't let you work with us, you'll go down the street and work with the group that is willing. So Lord God, we pray, please, that you would have your perfect and powerful work. In the name and for the glory and honor of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.